So talking about plain films or x-rays, we really know that the cost is much less expensive than any other imaging modality out there. Uh, so that's an advantage. It's highly available and it, it has high resolution. Actually, it has a higher resolution than CT and MRI. And this is a very technical term, but in essence, uh, CT and MRI, we really have other types of resolution. In CT, we have contrast resolution. In MRI, for example, we would have greater temporal resolution and even contrast res resolution in addition to tissue characterization. Um, the plain films are really uh, high resolution and therefore uh, it's a modality that can allow a lot of detail even when it's uh, not very expensive and highly available. The plain film assessment, the classic ABCS, which is for, uh, stands for alignment, bones, cartilage, and soft tissues. The alignment we'll review later, but we're really talking about four main lines that we draw around the spine we have the bones so we want to make sure all the bones are intact then we can assess the cartilage and the soft tissue as allowed by indirect signs from our plain film because this are not really well seen on on plain film assessment so here we have an example of a normal cervical radiograph we have a nice alignment all the bones look fine they're equally mineralized and symmetric so uh, and also the intervertebral disc space is maintained on all of the levels so that's our way of assessing uh, the, the disc although we don't see them we see the height that should be maintained by the disc we also we can see soft tissues or, or soft tissue swelling if it was present again it's not very high sensitivity but we still look uh, in case there's something we can detect either subtle or major and th uh, that would present with changes on the soft tissues with the uh, plain film. So in this example uh, what I'm showing you is now the neural foramina or the schematic of uh, the artery in which you would have the virtual artery going through the cervical spine. You have the spinal cord and the neural foramina which all play a role in our assessment of the spine, especially in the setting of trauma. In uh, the image in the bottom left corner, you have the lamina, which is when we do a laminectomy uh, for a neurosurgical procedure. Then the patient uh, has surgery at this point. We have the pedicle, which is underneath the, the, the nerve root here. That would be the pedicle. And when you do fixations or a patient receive hardware fixation, Usually the, the screws are called transpedicular because they cross through the pedicle. And you can think of the pedicle as a safe uh, place to traverse the, the spine in order to reach the virtual body. So those are the main components that you should be aware. Uh, of course, you have the spinous process and the spinal canal here. But uh, the main thing or the hardest thing sometimes to identify after you have identify the spinous process and the virtual body is a lamina and then the pedicle which in this case is, is really seen underneath the nerve root here. These are the lines I was telling you about the four lines for assessment of the alignment of the cervical spine and I, I think these lines are tremendously important for example the, the first one the first line you would draw it in the anterior aspect of all the virtual bodies and that's a good way to assess for alignment if any uh, virtual body is displaced anteriorly or posteriorly by drawing this imaginary line uh, you would be able to detect it and uh, we're pointing out to several structures here first of all we we have the dense or the odontoid and in in this case, we also assess for the space in the allantoaxial joint. We have the posterior vertebral line. In, as the name implies, we take the posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies and we draw a line uh, through it. And you might ask, why are we drawing this line if we already have the anterior alignment? Well, the, in case of fractures, sometimes the change or the displacement might not be symmetric. So it's always good to assess the anterior alignment in the posterior alignment. Uh, you have the facet joints here, the kind of horizontal uh, or uh, 
uh, I should say oblique, but predominantly horizontal lines here. Uh, we have the pedicle, which we discussed earlier, and we have the spinous process. For the spinous process, then that kind of like uh, the spinal laminar line is a little bit uh, different. Some people would draw it at the base of the spinous processes and, and check for that alignment. And then you have the posterior spinous line, in which again it, it might have some variation because the spinous processes are not uh, equal in everyone, and they're not necessarily the most symmetric portion of the cervical spine. However, we still try to get this general curvature when we draw our posterior spinous line. And I think that covers uh, the main um, uh, aspect of the assessment for a cervical spine uh, alignment, which is your first, uh, should be the first thing you look at when you're looking at the cervical spine. Uh, on the right, you have the schematic of what we're looking at. You have the two virtual bodies, the uh, intravertebral disc, and the nerve roots coming from the neural foramina, which uh, we also assess, as I'll show you in a minute. Here we have the neural foramina in which we can see nice and open spaces, and we can uh, predict that the nerve is coming out from that neural foramina without being compressed because it looks like an open space. In the event of a fracture or severe degenerative disease, then we could have some obliteration of this area and therefore suspect that some of the patient's symptoms, in, in case you have uh, neuropathic symptoms, can be coming from this region. Uh, on the left, again, is a schematic, and we're really representing the same thing, the uh, neural foramina from the cervical spine. So plain film assessment, we covered the alignment. The other thing I wanted to cover with you is kind of uh, the Scotty dog, which is a, a kind of like an anatomical reference or a schematic uh, dog that we can imagine as we look uh, it, mainly in an oblique view of the of the spine. In this case, we're looking at a lumbar spine, and the the Scotty dog is a good anatomical reference. So we'll we'll go over the Scotty dog in a minute, but I wanted you to be aware and see if you can identify it here, the same schematic here on the right, and I'm going to show you this is uh, a frontal view. Here you have the Scotty dog, like I said, mainly in the oblique view is where you can see it, and this is a frontal view, and the question in this case is uh, asking you to identify the structure we are uh, pointing, which is indicated here by the arrow, and you have three different projections. You have the frontal view, you have the oblique view and you have the lateral view and they're all pointing to the same structure. So what do you think it is? So based on what we talked, the this structure is going to be the pedicle and it's, uh, I guess, initially easier to identify here that we're dealing with the pedicle. Uh, another way of seeing it and you should uh, also look for kind of like the, the, the face here, two eyes, and the spinous process represents the nose. And the whole idea for looking for the symmetry is that your eye would become, would notice if there's a case in which you have an asymmetry and then further inspect that level to assess if you have a fracture or a malignancy that can sometimes distort that anatomy. So all, all this and all images, what we're looking at is the pedicle. As you can see, it represents kind of like the head of the Scotty dog. Uh, in this case, this is the lateral projection and the frontal projection. So why why is this important? So spondylolysis and spondylolysis are really technical terms to describe a defect, right? Uh, we're talking about lysis. You can think of in biology like lysis of the cell. And spondylolysis already implies there's some shift or some change in alignment. So you can have spondylolysis in which you have the defect, but not necessarily change in alignment. And then once you have a change in alignment from the spondylolysis, then uh, you have spondylolysis. The uh, pars, the junction of the pedicle, the lamina, and the facet, we already reviewed the pedicle. So now we'll see where the pars is located in relationship to the pedicle. The spondylolysis is usually seen at the lower lumbar levels, uh, L4 and L5. And spondylolisthesis, like I said, it will be a change or, or movement of the virtual body uh, in relationship to the one below. 
this is an example of a normal cervical spine and you can see uh, we have we still have some degeneration here some increased uh, sclerotic changes at the set joints which are here at every level but in essence this is a pretty normal uh, lumbar spine sorry I don't know if I said cervical uh, lumbar spine and we have the L1 L2 L3 L4 and L5 levels you can see we have the symmetry and the quote unquote the eyes and then we have the uh, nose here so we have this phase that we look for on the AP projection and then you can think of the oblique projection as a projection in which you're looking for the Scotty dog and making sure everything's symmetric. So now I'm going to show you again the Scotty dog but look what happened here. So we have a defect and it's actually kind of like around the neck of the Scotty dog. So you have the pedicle and then the, uh, the neck will represent kind of the pars uh, area. So this is a normal pars and you can see the head of the Scotty dog, the neck and uh, the leg will represent the facet joint and that would be a normal pars in this level you already have a defect and this is what we call a pars defect or a spondylolysis and uh, that's an example of spondylolysis we haven't identified any shift or any change in alignment to call it spondylolisthesis this is a, a schematic diagram like again, you see the pars here, there's the lysis, and then if there's movement, then it's spondylolisthesis. And in this case, you also have some disc inflammation because there's more, uh, more of a trauma or more significant trauma to this region. The alignment for anterolisthesis, in this case, we have what would be called uh, anterolisthesis of L5 in relationship to L uh, S1. Uh, this line should really connect with the sacral line and there, there are all sorts of measurements here in terms of the uh, sacrum in relationship to L5 and um, again here we cannot really appreciate uh, the fact that there's a spondylolisthesis uh, there or a spondylolysis but the main thing is to check for the alignment just like you did for the cervical spine. Okay guys so that's it for this section and the next section will cover CT and MRI.